Good morning. May I encourage you to take out your bulletins as a skeletal outline there that I think will be of help to you as we continue our summer Sunday morning worship series entitled The Fruit of the Spirit. The Fruit of the Spirit. Let me also remind you that CDs of all of the morning messages, evening messages are available to you. If you will go back to the uh, information foyer behind the worship center, there's a media table there, and one of the ladies will be happy to uh, provide you with copies of this and tell you how you can get them. They're not expensive, but people do uh, like to have various messages. You can listen to them over and over and let them sink in and uh, glean the maximum possible benefit from them. So we invite you to do that. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, I'd like to begin reading in verse 22. We do stand in honor of God's Word. I'm reading out of the New King James translation. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, thank You so much for the opportunity that You have given us to gather again today and to learn about Your Holy Spirit and this life in the Spirit. And Father, we ask that You would, by Your Spirit, teach us. Open our hearts and minds. For it is in Jesus' name that we acknowledge our complete and total dependency upon You. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Paul says in verse 25, If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. A viable translation might also be, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Turn with me in your Bibles back over to John chapter 15, a chapter with which you are very, very familiar, I believe. It's where Jesus teaches using the metaphor of the vine and the branches. We're going to spend uh, our time this morning in John 15. The reason for the series, The Fruit of the Spirit, is because there is still much misunderstanding and confusion regarding the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit in many circles today, including Baptist circles. We're trying to clarify that teaching in the Bible. We ask, first of all, the question, who is the Holy Spirit? And we discovered from the Bible that the Holy Spirit is God. Everything that makes the Father God and the Son God makes the Holy Spirit God. He is just as much God as Jesus is God. The three in one, the triune God. We asked the question, what is the ministry of the Holy Spirit? And we looked at His ministries in the world and also in the life of the believer. And we looked at numerous ministries, and I confess that the list that we gave you did not exhaust the biblical teaching on the ministries of the Holy Spirit. But what we wanted to communicate to you is this. The Holy Spirit is intimately involved in your daily life in ways that we would not probably commonly understand. He is more intimately involved in your life than you can even imagine. You don't have a more intimate, more loving more loyal and faithful friend on the earth than the Spirit of the living God. And then last week we asked the question, well, 
how can I be filled, that is, empowered by the Holy Spirit? Notice in your bulletin, if you would, please, we suggested that there are four things we need to do to be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Number one, we need to recognize the need. If you don't recognize the need, you're not going to ask for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We need to recognize the need. Second, we need to confess our sins. The Holy Spirit wants to fill a holy and clean vessel, a holy and clean you. Third, we said we need to obey the command, Ephesians 5.18. God commands us to be filled moment by moment by the Holy Spirit. We need to obey that command. Filling of the Spirit is something you allow God to do, not something you gin up. All right? And then fourth, we need to honor the Lordship of Christ. We need to securely put Jesus on the throne of our hearts, and we get off. No rival to the supreme lordship of our lives. When you and I recognize the need, when we confess our sin, when we obey the command, and when we yield to Christ's lordship, we can be filled with God's Spirit, empowered by His Spirit. I can do all things, Paul said, through Him who strengthens, that is, empowers me. The secret to the victorious and abundant Christian life is not you trying to do better, but it is you and me yielding to the infilling and empowering ministry of God's Spirit. So once we are filled with the Spirit, then the question comes to mind, okay, how then do I walk in the Spirit? Paul says if you live in the Spirit, then you should walk in the Spirit. So walking in the Spirit, obviously, is where you and I live on a daily basis. So this morning we're asking the question, how do I walk in the Spirit of God? Let's look at that. And as you might would expect, uh, walking in the Spirit is going to be very similar to how you initially are filled with the Spirit. That shouldn't be a surprise to you. But we're going to look at it in a little greater detail. I like what Dr. Dwight Pentecost, who for many years taught at Baptist at, uh, at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, and he wrote a book called Patterns for Maturity, in which Dr. Pentecost talks about the disciplines that bring us to spiritual maturity. And one of those was walking in the Spirit. And he says God's ideal is to have his child so under the control of or possessed by the Spirit of God, that the life of Christ is manifested in you and in me by the Spirit's filling. There, there is no plan B. If there were a plan B, Southern Baptists would have discovered it a long time ago. But we have tried plan B. We have tried plan C. We've tried plan D and probably all the way to, to about plan X. And they don't work. Only plan A works. In fact, Dr. Billy Graham and others have suggested is up to 90% of Christians are not walking in the Spirit. They are frustrated. They are defeated believers, struggling, trying to be better Christians if they haven't given up, and they haven't discovered plan A. Well, today we're talking about plan A, the only plan that God has given for the victorious and abundant Christian life. Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, I'm come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Would you say that your Christian life is abundant? Would you say it's victorious with any consistency? It can be. It can be. All right. So how do you walk in the Spirit? Number one, surrender to Jesus' Lordship. Surrender to Jesus' Lordship. That's step number one to walking in the Spirit. Look with me uh, to this John 15, verses 1 and 14. Would you mind reading this together with me? I am the true vine. You are my friends if you keep my commandments. Now, what Jesus is saying there is that He expects to be the supreme commander of the lives of His followers. Well, how in the world do you get that out of that? 
Well, in John 15, Jesus is using the metaphor of the vine and the branches to teach the spirit-filled life. In the Gospel of John, John, by the Holy Spirit, is led to record seven of Jesus' I Am statements. Seven of them. I believe Jesus probably made a lot more than seven I Am statements. But the Holy Spirit led John the Apostle, Apostle to include seven of these because seven is the perfect number in the Jewish mindset. All right? Seven times Jesus said, I am. Like, I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and so forth. Seven times recorded in the Gospel of John. When Jesus said, I am, His audience understood that He was claiming the personal name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, which means I am. They understood that. That's one of the reasons Sanhedrin was not very happy with Jesus, and they accused Him of blasphemy, claiming to be God which, incidentally, he never denied. He never denied that claim. He only denied that his kingdom was on the earth at that time. All right? Very instructional. So when Jesus said, I am, he was claiming to be God. Now, in the Jewish mind, the seventh of the seven statements is the pinnacle statement. Would you like to guess which of the seven I am statements was number seven? That one. That's in front of you. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. Jesus was claiming not to, just to be God, but He said, I am the true vine. Isn't that interesting? I am Almighty God, and I'm not just a vine. I am the true vine. Now, what is a vine? A vine is a source of life, right? Right? He's going to explain further in John 15 as he teaches through the metaphor that you and I are like branches. And he, though, is the vine. And what is the job of the branch? Abide. All it's supposed to do is to abide in the vine. Right? There you go. Just has to abide. Just hang around the vine. Just hang around. All right? Be tied into the vine. He says, I am God. I am the true source of life. And then to clarify what he's talking about, he says over in verse 14, you're my friends if you keep my commandments. In other words, he said, I don't call you my servants anymore. I'm calling you my friends because you've been with me for quite some time now. And he said, if you're really my friends, if you're my, my true disciples, my true followers, you're going to obey my commandments. Now, let me give you one word for obeying the commandments. Lordship. He is claiming to be Almighty God, and He says, I have the right to require of you obedience to my commandments. I expect to sit as the supreme authority in your life, the Lord sitting on the throne of your heart. Now, again, this shouldn't, shouldn't surprise you because the most central and key issue in all of creation is lordship. Who's on the throne? God's on the throne in heaven, right? God should be on the throne of the hearts of His people, right? God is not on Satan's throne of Satan's heart. God is not on the throne of the hearts of the lost people who are in rebellion against God. But He wants to be on the throne of their hearts. Bless God, when you and I were alienated from God, lost in our trespasses and sin, living in rebellion, children of wrath, He saved our souls and claimed the throne of our hearts. So He is the Lord of our hearts. Ultimately, Jesus is going to come back to the earth. His throne will be in Jerusalem, and He will be Lord over all the earth. That's what it's all about. Jesus being supreme Lord and commander. So, if you're going to walk in the Spirit, you've got to get the Lordship issue resolved. I am suggesting that before your feet hit the floor in the morning, you should be saying, Jesus, I want you on the throne of my heart today. That, that, that ought to be the, 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 how you set the day off. That's one of the reasons many people have quiet times in the morning because they very quickly establish who's in charge of the day. 
the king, and I've come to your throne to be with you. Get my marching orders, okay? I wish I could say first thing in the morning, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my heart, and that issue is settled for the rest of the day. It's just not that simple. Too many things come at me during the day. Too many things come at you during the day in which you and I have to make a decision. Am I going to let Jesus sit on the throne in this or am I going to take the throne and do it my way? Either I'm going to obey His commandments or I'm going to do it my way. And when I choose to obey His commandments, I'm choosing to let Him be on the throne. When I choose to disobey His will and to do it my way, to do my will, then I'm taking charge. He's a gentleman king. He'll step off the throne. He'll not step out of my heart. But if I want to reign, He's going to let me reign because I'm created in His image and likeness and He's given me that authority in my own heart. He will only sit on the throne of my heart if I will choose to allow Him to do so. So during the day, I've got to keep making that choice to let Jesus have the throne. If something comes into my life and I begin to worry and become anxious, take my eyes off of Jesus put my eyes on the problem. I'm not standing on the promises. I'm not trusting Jesus. I'm being overwhelmed with worry, fears, and anxieties. Who's on the throne of my heart? Come on. Self. I'm not choosing to trust Jesus. I'm not choosing to lay this problem at His feet. I'm choosing to worry with it. Uh, I read an interesting uh, comment in a book. They said, when you look into the future at a problem you're facing and you look into the future and you start imagining the worst possible scenarios and you start worrying over that those scenarios, Jesus, interestingly, is never in that scenario. Is a, yeah, I never thought about that. I said, that is absolutely true. He's never in those scenarios that we worry about in the future. That's putting myself on the throne. I've got to confess that is sin, get off the throne, and ask Jesus to reign there. And then we do it His way, which is the way of faith and obedience. Okay? So I've got to get this issue addressed early in the day and throughout the day so that Jesus can sit on the throne of my heart. And whenever He's not on the throne, the Holy Spirit lets me know it, and I've got to address that issue. And we'll talk about that a little more. Okay? So first, if you're going to walk in the Spirit... Jesus has got to be on the throne. It's only when He's on the throne that the Holy Spirit can give us His power. Number two, if you're going to walk in the Spirit, once Jesus is on the throne, you've got to learn to depend on Jesus. Depend on Jesus. Read with me from John 15, verse 5, please. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, Jesus is saying, I am the vine. You are the branches. I can almost see Jesus getting Peter between his hands and patting on Peter's cheeks. Peter, do I have your attention? I am the vine, Peter. I am. You are the branches. Is that clear? You know? Hey, I need for him to do that because sometimes I forget. I forget who's the vine and who's the branch. Okay? Anytime I think I can do it myself, am I a vine or a branch? I'm a branch, but I'm trying to be a vine, right? I'll never be anything but a branch. That's all I am all I was created to be. But I can try to be a vine. Is it going to work? No. It's not plan A. It's not the plan. It'll never work. Because if I can do something myself, I learn to depend on me. If I have to look to Jesus, then I learn to depend on Him. And remember, The more dependent upon myself that I am, the more dependent, dependent I am on circumstances that buffet my life. The more dependent I am upon Jesus, the more independent I am of the circumstances that buffet my life. That's a juicy tidbit. All right? So we need to depend on Jesus. 
Now, Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branch. Have you ever seen a branch straining, just trembling, straining to produce something? Fruit, grapes. Jim, have you ever seen a vine straining? Have you? Not really, have you? Okay. Dean, have you ever seen a branch straining to produce fruit? No. Anybody ever seen anybody ever seen a branch straining to, under the burden? They don't do that. They just, as I said, hang around, and the life of the vine comes out, and the branch is able to do what the branch was created to do, and that's bear fruit. It doesn't mean that the circumstances for the branch are always pleasant. It's not always 72 degrees and sunny. The rain and the storms may come and some hail may fall. Uh, time, winds can blow. Heat can come. But that branch, if it'll abide in the vine, it can do okay. Even under bad circumstances, it can produce fruit. But it's got to depend on the vine. Now, notice Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Understanding what Jesus means is critically important because you can do a lot of things apart from Jesus. If that were not true, Jesus would never have made this statement. You don't have to state the obvious. It's only when the obvious is not obvious that the obvious needs to be stated. Jesus is saying, look, apart from my life in you, you cannot produce fruit. It's that simple. My life in you is going to produce the fruit. Now, we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit in the weeks ahead. We're going to talk about what the fruit are. But Jesus says, apart from me, you cannot bear fruit. doesn't mean you can't do a lot of things. But it means that apart from Jesus, everything you do is flesh. And the flesh profits nothing. Nothing. You cannot produce any fruit in your flesh that God can really use to, to bless others and to move His kingdom forward. Can't do it. He will not honor the flesh. He'll honor the Spirit and the things of the Spirit. He honors the things He initiates. So Jesus is saying... Whatever you can do, you need to abide in me and depend upon me to do it in you and through you. Okay? Lord, I want you to make me a more loving husband. That's a lot better than saying, I am going to be a more loving husband. If it kills me, if it kills my family, I'm going to be a more loving husband. No. Lord, I need for you to make me a more loving husband. I am dependent upon you in this thing. Uh, if you're a school teacher, Lord, I want to be an effective teacher. Not just teaching math. I want to have an impact in the lives of these students. But I want you to do it in me and through me. If you wait on tables at a restaurant, Lord, if I can't turn this into a ministry platform, why am I doing this job? So I'm coming in today. I don't know who's going to be coming into this restaurant. People will be snappy and short with me. I don't know what's going on in their lives. And they'll take things out on me because I'm available. Lord, I want you to fill me. I want you to, to bear the fruit of love and peace and joy and patience through me. And I want them to see something supernatural in my life as it lights up with your love. I want this to be you, not me. Folks, we need to come to understand that our lives are not so much about us as they are about Jesus. See, we, we, we want to live as though everything in my life is about me. And my life is me-centered. And my happiness, what I want, is the most important thing. We need to get over that. That is just not the case. If I'm a follower of Jesus, my life is about Jesus. And what brings honor and glory to Him. And if I happen to find happiness in the process, well, that's wonderful. God's not opposed to my happiness. He's just not necessarily as committed to my happiness as I am. Yeah, that's kind of got your attention. God has committed your holiness. He has committed your holiness. He's more concerned that you and I be holy, that we be like Jesus, than that we be happy. And if you believe anything other than that, 
you and I need to sit down and talk. We really, really do. And as long as I think God's ultimate goal for me is to be happy, then my whole life revolves around me. When I realize that God wants me to be like Jesus, to be holy, then I begin to understand it's really not about me, is it, God? It's about you. So being about Him, it's about Him manifesting Himself through you and through me in every facet of our lives. Okay? So once I'm surrendering areas of my life to Jesus, and that is a growing process, that I want as much of my life under His Lordship as possible so that He can manifest His life and get His work done through me. The more spiritually mature you and I are, the more consciously and conscientiously we will look to Jesus for His grace and for His strength in all that we do. Things that we know we can do and that we can do well, we still look to Jesus and say, Lord, would you please give me your grace and do this through me. I've done hospital visitation, and I'm going back to my car, and it occurs to me I didn't pray about that visitation. And I say, oh, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I, I always try to pray before I come visit with you guys. But I, sometimes I'm busy, whatever, distracted, and, I, and I, I ask God's forgiveness. I really do. If you were blessed by that visit, it's because of His Word, <laughs> not my flesh. Okay? We should consciously <clears throat> walk in a dependent relationship upon Jesus. This can happen. And many of you are doing this in your lives on a daily basis. All right? Number three, trust Jesus. Trust Him. If you're going to say, Lord, I need you, then you've got to trust Him. In John 15, verse 7, would you read that with me, please? If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Um, trusting Jesus, where does that begin? Well, Jesus tells us in John 15. He says, my word, if my word abides in you, if my word abides in you, you and I could study the four Gospels the rest of our lives and we would be all the much better off for it. The epistles of the apostles are commentaries on the teachings of Jesus in the Gospel. But the teachings of Jesus are our primary source of understanding. Now, Jesus says, trust my word. Abide in my word. What does Paul say? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. So as you and I get into the word of God, the Bible, the word of Christ, then we become more understanding of God's will and God's purposes. Everything I'm sharing with you, you could discover yourself if you are in the Word of God. And some of you are saying, well, I haven't heard anything new today. Okay, that's fine. We're both studying the same Bible. Okay? In fact, if I tell you something you've never heard before, you better demand that you see it in the Bible or you might ought to reject it. Okay? So the Word is the standard. Jesus is saying, abide in my Word. Let my Word encourage your faith. Then when you need to stand on my promises, you know what promises to stand upon. You can trust in God's character. That's wonderful. But it's better to stand on a word of promise. That's when you're strongest. When God's Spirit quickens to your heart a promise, and you say, Lord, I'm standing on this promise. Jesus says, He who abides in me shall bear much fruit. That's interesting. Jesus is talking in terms of absolute certainty. He says that if you will daily abide in Him and let His Spirit communicate His life to you and through you, He says you're going to bear a little bit of fruit. Huh? How about uh, a little bit more fruit? What did he say? He said much fruit. Much fruit. You're going to bear it. In fact, Jesus is saying, if you will simply walk under my lordship in dependency upon me and let me fill you with my spirit and live my life through you, you will bear more fruit by accident 
than you could ever bear intentionally in the flesh. In fact, I believe with all my heart, Jesus won't even let you know all the fruit that you're bearing this side of eternity because if He did, you might get proud and not of any use to Him anymore. Uh, I remember my older brother Jim, uh, who's a Presbyterian pastor, Bible-believing Presbyterian pastor who has a heart for soul winning. He was at a conference in his, uh, of his church, and he ran into a young uh, Presbyterian pastor. And they got to talking. And uh, this young pastor found out that Jim uh, went to the University of Georgia. And this guy said, well, I went to the University of Georgia also. And Jim said, well, I have a brother who pastored uh, First Baptist Church of Watkinsville there in Athens, Georgia. And he said, that's where I went. In fact, he said, I was under your brother's ministry when God called me to, uh, to, to uh, pastor. Well, I didn't know that. I didn't have a clue. I wouldn't know it today if Jim had not shared it with me. And I'm thinking, boy, there's fruit I didn't know about. But see, God seldom lets us know all that He's doing in us and through us because He doesn't want us to get distracted. Now, I admit sometimes we get a little discouraged, don't we? We just don't seem to see the kind of fruit we'd like to see. But our responsibility is not to strain and grunt trying to produce fruit and then get discouraged when we don't see what we'd like to see. Our responsibility is to abide as branches in the vine. The fruit is not the fruit of the branch. It's the fruit of the vine. Exactly. That's important. If it's not the fruit of the branch, then it's even more critical that I learn to abide in Christ and in the walk in the fullness of His Spirit so that He can accomplish in me and through me whatever He wants to do, whether I know about it or not. All right? So whatever you do, you need to do it consciously in dependency upon Christ, trusting Jesus to do and to bear the fruit in you and through you that He's wanting to bear. All right? Next, if you're going to walk in the Spirit, then you've got to obey the Lord Jesus. You're not only surrendering to Him, you're going to obey Him. All right? Let's read John 15, 10 together, please. Jesus says, If you obey My commandments, you will abide in My love. If you obey My commandments, you will abide in My love. Did Jesus expect His disciples to obey His commandments? Yes, He did. It is a mark of the disciples that we love one another. That's one of the marks that proves we're His disciples. But loving one another is, I believe, one of the fruit of the Spirit that comes as a result of making a choice to obey Jesus' command. Okay? Uh, Obedience is a choice. And when Jesus issues a command, it takes faith to step out and choose to obey that command. Um, Because His commands are always in our best interest. We've got an object lesson in front of our very eyes in the governor of South Carolina. Obviously, he's had some religious training. Because in his press conference, he acknowledged that he had violated God's laws and that there are consequences to doing that. He acknowledged that God's commandments are for our protection and for our good and that he had violated the command. And now he's become an object lesson of the hurt and the humiliation and the betrayal of violating the commands of God. So when you and I choose to obey Jesus, that choice to obey reflects at least a mustard seed of faith that we are trusting Him to do in us and through us whatever He's commanding us to do. That's one of the secrets of the victorious Christian life. Everything that the New Testament commands me to do, if I will abide in Christ, His Spirit will will enable me to do it. 
you hear that? If you're still looking at the commands of the New Testament as things you've got to, to bucket up, grit your teeth, and do, then you've missed the grace of the New Testament. The victorious Christian life is not you doing the best you can do. It's you being yielded and letting Christ fulfill the commandments through you. He'll give you the grace to do it. You want to be faithful to your spouse? You ask the Lord Jesus, Lord, please give me the grace to be faithful to my spouse. And if I'm unfaithful, just kill me. That's what I've said. Just kill me. Just cut me off the vine, take me home. That's serious. Lord, give me the grace to obey. And if I am disobedient, then you have the right to prune, to discipline. And I trust that you will do whatever is necessary to bring me back into the ways of righteousness. Governor Stanford is experiencing discipline if he's God's child. He's experiencing it now. Okay? So we need to obey Jesus. Now, again, if you know His Word, isn't it easier to obey Jesus if you know His Word, His commandments? Sure. It's a lot easier. So it's important, again, to know His Word so that you can obey Him. I really, really appreciate that great old hymn of the faith. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Folks, trusting and obedience, those are the two legs we walk on in the power and grace of the Holy Spirit. See? But I'm telling you, when you trust Jesus and obey Him, you're letting Him sit on the throne of your heart. You're letting Him be the boss. When you choose not to trust Him, you're kicking Him off the throne and you're putting yourself on. When you choose not to obey Him, you're kicking Him off and you're putting yourself on the throne. And uh, any way you want to look at it, any sin that you and I commit ultimately is an expression of a lack of faith and disobedience. That's what it all boils back down to. So if you're going to walk in the Spirit, you do just the opposite. You trust and obey. Are you with me? All right. And then finally, you confess all sin to Jesus. You confess all sin to Jesus. Jesus is a gentleman king. If He will surrender the throne to me, if I want to sit there, which He will, that is in essence, what we call sin, me sitting on the throne of my own heart. That's sin. Righteousness is letting Jesus sit on that throne. Now, if I am on the throne, that is sin. Sin grieves and quenches the Holy Spirit. It dishonors Jesus, brings a lot of pain and hurt into my life and lives of those lives of those I care about. I've got to deal with that. How do I deal with it? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I confess my sin. What is confession? Confession means I agree with God that I'm sitting on the throne, I've been disobedient, I've been unbelieving, and I've done some things that dishonor Him. That, that, I'm just being honest with Him. Very specific and honest. I'm agreeing with God against myself. Once I confess my sin, I claim His forgiveness. I don't have to beg and plead. I claim His forgiveness by faith. Why? Because 1 John 1, 9 says we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. So I claim His promise. Then I say, Lord, I want You to sit on the throne of my heart. I'm getting off. I want You on the throne of my heart. Now, I need to obey You in this area that I just disobeyed You in. I need to make things right with those I've hurt. That's confession of sin. If the Holy Spirit doesn't convict you of sin, you don't have to confess it. But when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, then you deal with it. And this is a process. Uh, it's interesting. Jesus uh, loves to use play on words. And uh, in the original Aramaic, those who've translated the Greek New Testament back into an Aramaic equivalent, can see a lot of play on words that, that his audience would have picked up. This happens to be a play on words that kind of picks up uh, in the uh, New Testament language as well. Jesus says, Every branch in me that bears fruit, he cleanses 
Some of your translations say he purges or he prunes. And those are fine. But he cleanses is good because it catches the play on words. Then he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The word clean in the second phrase is from the same root word as he cleanses or prunes in the first phrase. So it's a play on words. Okay. Um, so Jesus is saying, and by the way, the word cleanses there, he cleanses, is a continuing process. And he's simply saying this, as you walk abiding in me, the Father is going to work to deal with sin in your life. He's not going to deal with everything at once. That would be too overwhelming and discouraging. But he's going to pick things that he wants to deal with. Now, he'll listen to your wife, and then he'll deal with those things that your wife wants him to deal with. Sometimes wives like to play Holy Spirit, right? We all like to play Holy Spirit sometimes. Now, the Holy Spirit's going to deal with things in your life, and when he gets those dealt with to a certain point, then he looks at other things. But all of your life, because none of us arrive to perfection, the Holy Spirit is dealing with cleansing us in the airs of sin. But it also carries a connotation of pruning. I don't know if any of you have peach trees, but if if you have any decent fruit in any spring with your peach trees, it's because you have done some very specific pruning before the spring growth began. You don't prune your peach tree because you despise it. You prune it, prune it, you cleanse it, so that it can bear better quality fruit. Maybe you're not looking so much for quantity, but quality fruit. So you prune it. Notice what Jesus says. Every branch that bears fruit, He cleanses. He goes on, and I left it out here because it doesn't have space. He said, so that you might bear more fruit. Do you know what the reward is for bearing much fruit? For abiding in Jesus, letting Him fill you with His Holy Spirit, so that He can bear fruit in your life and through you. The reward for that is you get more pruning. Yeah, you get more pruning. You're saying, "Uh, I don't like the sound of that. That doesn't sound like fun to me. Well, I I didn't say it was fun. It's pruning. Uh, Would you tell me what pruning is? That's when God is shaving off the rough edges, sometimes with sandpaper, sometimes with a chisel and a hammer. Uh, wouldn't that kind of hurt sometimes? Oh, yeah, it can hurt. That's why James says, Consider all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials. And then he gives you some of the benefits of the pruning process. When God wants to prune you, it's so you can bear more fruit. Some of you have been through such heartache in your lives. Not ever, just everybody goes through that kind of heartache. But you have been able to embrace somebody else who is going through that same or a similar kind of heartache. You've been able to comfort them. You've been able to cry with them. You've been able to encourage them for one reason and one reason only. God took you through a similar pruning experience. And because you're walking in His his Spirit, God can use that in your life to reach out to others. And you can bear fruit.